and uh, we'll have it. So like I said, we're going to finish up with section 1.5, just talking about inverses of secant and cosecant and cotangent functions, primarily just talking about their domains and ranges. I got markers, so be right back. something as I was running through the halls. The tutoring room is now open. So, um, if you if you need extra help beyond what I can give you during office hours or during class, in the tutoring room is rooms 138. So just down there. And it's the room across from it. So there's like two rooms that face each other, uh, and the bonus room, I can't remember its number. But it's officially open, it opens, I think, at 9, and it closes at 4, every day, Monday through Thursday. On Friday, it's only open 9 to 2, I think. Um, and my shifts are Tuesday and Thursday uh, from 12 to 1.20 in the afternoon. So if you want to catch extra help from me specifically, you can go during that time. If you've had enough of me, then please go some at some other time. Uh, there's, there's good students in there to help you out with your issues or questions or, you know, maybe just like interest. Whether it's a YouTube video about Riemann questions or not or whatever it is, uh, stop on by. Okay? So that's that. Now that we got markers, we can actually get started. So just to back up a little bit and draw another unit circle on the board to review some things. If we have a little circle, we fix one of the edges of an angle along the positive x-axis, and we let another edge, uh, another line segment sort of track around the circle. Uh, we call that angle T. This point that moves around the circle as the triangle, as the angle moves, uh, that has an x coordinate and a y coordinate. This x coordinate we call the cosine of the angle T, and this y coordinate we call the sine of angle T. And if we think about what that means in terms of like the values of sine and cosine, I'll graph sine here first. If our point, our angle is nothing, and that means we're right here, that means the y coordinate is also nothing, because we're on this, this xy plane. The point is on the x axis, so we're at a height of zero. If we move up to here, then we're at an angle of pi over two, and we're re we've reached our maximum value of one. If we go from here down to here, so our angle is now this. That's an angle of pi. That's halfway around the circle, which has a circumference of 2 pi. We're back down to a height of nothing. If we go a little further to here, that's an angle of 3 pi over 2. We're at a value of negative 1 for sine, the y-coordinate. And this just continues. At 2 pi, we're back up to 0. At 2 pi plus pi over 2, which is 5 pi over 2, we're back up to 1. And this curve just continues to move in this pattern over and over and over. So this is sine. So you remember, perhaps, that there's this related function cosecant of x, cosecant of t, 
which is the reciprocal of sine. So as a graph, um, it looks very similar at certain points to sine. For example, whenever sine takes the value of 1, cosecant takes the value of 1. Whenever sine takes the value of negative 1, cosecant also takes the value of negative 1, because we're just taking the reciprocal of 1 and negative 1. But then there are these other, other problems, right? When, uh, when we're dividing by 0, when sine is 0, uh, we don't necessarily know what to do with cosecant. Um, so I'll put dotted lines there everywhere sine is 0, because that'll represent where we're dividing by 0. But then there's other nice, nice values. For example, there are certain angles where the y coordinate is exactly 1 half, so right about here on that graph. So at this angle here, does anyone know what angle that is? Sine is equal to 1 half, what is that angle? Hassan? Uh, pi, three. pi over, over three. six. six. Pi over six. Pi over three would be root three over two. For sine, right? For sine. Pi over six would be about here. Pi over three is about there. The first one's the one half. Hi. Yeah. So, nice try. Nice try. Pi over six would be right about here. That's another spot where we have a height of one half. These markers. I think these might be. I almost want to stop the recording so that you all then doesn't scream at me. These might be pre-COVID markers that are surplus now. I'm not sure. But I'm going through them like uh, like firewood, I guess, as they say. So not working very well. So this angle, <clears throat> which is pi minus pi over six, also for sine has a value of one half. We're taking the reciprocal of one half, which means we're at a value of two now. So if we're up here at 2, we've got this point and this point, and we're going to have that same pattern repeated here, so height of 2 here and here, more or less. So if we were to continue to do this for these other points, we'd find that the graph of cosecant looks something like this up here. It's like a bunch of parabolas repeated over and over again. And then down below, it's going to be the same pattern. <coughs> but flipped. So there's angles here and here where the sine takes a value of negative one half, which means the reciprocal cosecant of t is, a, is at a value or at a height of negative two. So right about here, right about here, and over here we have another point, right by the negative two. So this graph looks like a bunch of Parabolas both coming up from below and coming down from above. So as I explained last week, uh, when we deal with functions, which sine is, uh, sometimes we need to ensure that the inverse is also a function. Uh, and the way to do that is to restrict the original. And in order to you know, make sine inverse a function, we restricted our sine graph to just values between here and here. For cosecant, we're going to do some a little bit of a different, a little bit of a similar thing. We're going to restrict ourselves to values um, I'm pretty sure it's between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we're going to, and I'll just double check. Nope, your book uses a different one. Your book actually doesn't use that. Okay, well, good thing I double check. Your book uses this choice. Really? Interesting. 
thing. Okay. So your book traces out this portion. So the main point, the primary point, is to make sure we have a one-to-one -one function. So if we restrict ourselves to this domain, so that's original angles in the interval 0 to pi over 2, uh, in, not including 0, including pi over 2 is OK, together with angles from pi to 3 <coughs> pi over 2, that's OK to include. Then the resulting piece of the, the resulting piece of the curve that we get is up here, which I'll just sort of accentuate with this red. Okay, it sort of seems like to me an odd choice of an odd choice of domain restriction. To me, it makes maybe more sense to require a centered domain right in here. This is how they define cosecant inverse. So, cosecant inverse, the list is going to remain down there for a bit. Cosecant inverse is going to take some value, and that value is going to have crazy, uh, crazy possibilities. We don't, we're not limited between negative 1 and 1 like we were with sine and cosine, right? Those things output numbers restricted by this, these boundaries. But cosecant, it goes super high and super low. It never goes in between 1 and negative 1. <coughs> okay? So this cosecant inverse is going to accept values. Uh, I think they use x as their input. Yep. Um, and it's going to output an angle. Okay, and y, I've already written this down here, y is an angle only between 0 to pi over 2 and an angle between pi to 3 pi over 2. So this portion of this curve is in fact, uh, passes the vertical line test, so it is a function, and it passes the horizontal line test, so it is in fact a, its inverse is in fact a function. Okay? Questions on that? So maybe like they don't even give any examples here of these. They say literally above these, these are less frequently used. And they're summarized here. So yeah, not as frequently used. I'll, I'll agree with that one. So secant is defined similarly. Secant of t is equal to 1 over cosine of t. So we take that x coordinate for some angle. We just take the reciprocal of it. That gives us secant of t. Cosine and sine's graphs are literally just shifts of each other. So the graph of secant is a shift of cosecant. So it looks exactly the same as this green one here, but the y-axis is moved just a little bit. Okay, so in the same regard, we'll need to restrict uh, the domain. And they do some restriction here where they, they take, again, only angles here. But we need to ensure certain things do not happen. So I'll, I'll leave that to you here in just a second to answer that question. Okay, so I can refer to it back in the circle. I can refer to this one as well. So this is where I'm going to ask you questions about secant and hope that you, you know some things about cosine. That's, that's the idea, right? Secant is just, it's, it's, a, it's directly related to cosine. So if I asked you, for example, here's pi over 2, and I asked what is secant of pi over 2, could you tell me what that is? Or if I asked you, hey, here's, here's an angle of nothing, I haven't moved anywhere, what is secant of zero? Could you tell me these things?
I know, you, maybe I know you can, maybe not. Which one is? Okay. It's related to zero. How did you get to zero? Okay, you, you looked around the unit circle and you said something in this coordinate is zero. The x coordinate, right? Yeah. So what does that mean? Which function of that angle is zero? Cosine is zero. So what is secant? Oof, one over zero. That's a problem. Okay, so before with our definition of cosecant, I graphed this out for you. We could plug in values like pi over two and you get something like one. Okay? Because this is just because that is just a shift of this, things like zero and pi over two almost switch places. We couldn't plug in zero before because we get division by zero. Now we can plug in 0, but we can't plug in pi over 2 because we've shifted the whole domain over. And this is exactly that result. Okay, so when we talk about the possible angles that come out, can we get pi over 2 out? We could before, but now the answer is going to be no. We can't get it out from the inverse function. Oh, we can't get it out, which means this. Okay, what is secant of zero? We've, we've, we've exercised a little bit. What is secant of zero? And can we get zero out as an angle from the inverse? Secant of zero. How do you do that? You look at cosine. What is cosine of zero? One. So we're over here. The coordinate is one comma zero. So where the secant of zero is one over cosine of zero, which means we've got one over one, which is just one. Okay. So if I ask you, what is secant inverse of one, you would definitely tell me zero. Okay. That's how these inverse functions work, right? They just map the output back to the previous inputs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So inverses do the exact opposite of what the original function does. That, that's just like the, their nature. So secant of zero, uh, let me erase graphs if that's okay. Secant of zero has a value of one. Just straight from this definition, secant of zero is one over cosine of zero. This is just the x coordinate of the point at an angle zero. So we look here, if we start at the x axis and we don't move, we're here. The x coordinate is 1. So this is 1 over 1. So secant as a function takes 0 and sends it to 1. Okay. Now the inverse function sends the outputs back to their original inputs. So that tells us that 1 uh, is sent to Zero. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe we can fill in the blanks here. That I've left. How are we with just knowing values of trig functions? That's that's not something I ever really asked. Um, it seemed like before one person knew this, if I asked you what's this, how many of you right now could like 
tell me that. Cosine of pi over 60, it's not that. Sine of that is that. How many of you could <coughs> tell me that? It's okay, I can turn the camera off. So. 